All right, everybody. Okay. Uh, I want to welcome everybody back uh, to uh, the Bureau of Economic Geology's summer seminar series. Uh, this is our first talk of 2021. Uh, we're very excited to kick this thing off. Uh, I'm Evan Civil. I'll be your host today. So uh, as you might know, this series is designed to highlight more than just the work we do here at the Bureau. Uh, it showcases the hobbies and the interest of our staff, as well as guests from outside the Bureau who might have uh, topics that are relative to our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, if you missed any one of these presentations, many can be found over at the Bureau's YouTube webpage. Uh, I encourage everybody to go check out that uh, back catalog of uh, presentations we have there. Uh, today's presenter is Dennis Campa. Dennis is our Administrative and Publication Sales Associate in the Bureau's bookstore. Last summer, Dennis gave a great talk on his rare and interesting collection of vinyl records, as well as his radio program, Adventures in Sound, on KOOP Austin Radio. In addition to his uh, record collection, Dennis has uh, been interested in vintage movies ever since childhood. He's been researching movies for nearly 40 years uh, with a special fondness for comedies and musicals. Uh, he's assisted with uh, research for several books and continues to collect information on film people of the past. Campa describes his house as, quote, overflowing with books, records, DVDs, Blu-rays, postcards, and thousands and thousands of scraps of papers and notes. Uh, so before we begin today, I kind of want to remind everybody to mute their microphone during the presentation. Uh, you can feel free to ask questions in the chat. Uh, you can also unmute yourself at the end of the presentation and ask them at that point. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Dennis. Dennis, thank you. Well, thanks a lot, Evan, and, uh, and also thanks to Raj and Aaron. Yes, my name is Dennis Kampa. I, as, as uh, Evan said, I work at the Bureau of Economic Geology, part of the Pickle Center, UT Austin Publication Sales Associate. And since September 2005, I've been hosting Adventures in Sound on KOP Radio, 91.7 FM, KOP.org, Saturdays 1 to 2 p.m. By the way, in KOP.org, you can find a link to recent episodes on Mixed Cloud. But I've been interested in older movies for decades. You know, growing up as a child, certainly in the 70s, there were still lots of independent stations and airtime to film, even, even the local national affiliates were not 24 seven. So you had lots of old movies and things like Little Rascals and Three Stooges and Law and Hardy on there. And of course, Warner Brothers cartoons. So I always enjoyed them. They're just part of growing up. And I'm sure a lot of folks out there enjoyed them as well you know, at a certain age. But the, the research really got kicked off maybe about 83, 84, junior high, high school, beginning that started doing research and it's just a it's a fun hobby you know nearly 40 years uh, as evan said i've sort of assisted with a couple of books i know a lot of film historians and archivists and quite a few have written books and i've helped with a couple of filmographies on character actors supporting players in movies particularly ones who appear in supporting players in short comedies which is a bit of a specialized field but uh people are into it are into it you know so that's a fun hobby of mine and I mainly collect information. You know, I do have lots of books. I'll, I'll flash a couple here throughout the presentation. And, after, and sometime next week, I'll send Evan a link to uh, trailers or previews to some of these movies or maybe excerpts. But as a, my interest is, as with music, it's mainly in movies from the dawn of cinema in the late 19th century to sometime in the 1970s. Um, and the collection of DVDs and Blu-rays keeps growing. Uh, well, what to buy, what to collect? Well, just stuff you enjoy. No one needs to have everything, you know, and can't afford any everything anyway. And there's not enough time to watch everything anyway. There's a lot of stuff to enjoy. But one, but one movie which I do have her in Blu-ray. I'm going to flash a few. This is one of the first movies I ever saw, although I don't remember seeing it at the theater. It is a theatrical run in 1972. Stupid so Come Home, second penis movie. With uh, songs by the Sherman Brothers, who wrote so songs for a lot of the Disney movies like Mary Poppins and the Jungle Book. Very cute movie. You know, I still enjoy it a lot decades later. My mom said I really loved that movie. Again, I don't remember seeing it at the time. I saw it many times on television over the decades. But my interest in the, in the beginning in the 80s, wanting to find more, I was just, oh, okay, well, let's compile a list of, you know, this supporting players' movies. 
And then I realized, well, no two filmographies are alike. There's a lot of uh, titles not listed in filmographies or some titles listed in their filmography that they're not actually in when you see the movie. Oh, okay, their scene was deleted or they were meant to be in this movie, but not. And then, you know, uh, a lot of titles I found on looking through, if you look through movie trade papers of the 20s and 30s, you'll find a lot of films that are not listed in IMDb, which is kind of a good reader's digest, I guess an okay reader's digest form, but for real nitty gritty stuff, you have to look to trade papers, studio records, if they exist, again, not all paperwork was kept, or sometimes find, news, find movie stills too. And when you dig deep, it's just amazing what you find. Before the seminar started, I was talking with Evan and Raj that about a year and a half ago, right before COVID really hit, my wife and I were in the Dallas Public Library, which I had not been to since I was a teenager. I spent many hours at the Dallas Public Library as a teenager doing research on old movies. And we were looking at some this one Dallas paper from the 1960s, which is not online anywhere. And we found some amazing gold. It's just fascinating looking through newspapers and seeing movie ads. In fact, the day I was born, uh, which was in San Antonio, I think the Love Bug, the Disney movie was playing, first of the great Herbie movies. And in Austin that same day, there was a Clint Eastwood spaghetti Western double feature at a, uh, at a drive-in. So th those are the type of things when you research that you will find that you know, you're not gonna find elsewhere. You have to look through newspapers. And if, if you do any amount of research looking through old newspapers, you realize they were a lot better uh, decades ago than they are now. And I'm gonna, you know, as I said throughout the presentation, get a, just kind of flash various movies that I have a fondness for. And one thing I've discovered talking with a lot of film historians and archives through the years that no one knows everything about any topic, any performer, any movie. There's always new information to uncover. Uh, even if you read someone's autobiography, well, there's things they could leave out deliberately or just forget. Human me memory is fallible, which is why paperwork is great. But there's always something new to learn, like how is a movie distributed overseas, like in Europe or Asia or Africa? So you learn that or you, or you find missing footage or you know, maybe someone who was married to someone who worked on the movie kept, kept some uh, diary. So that can reveal something. Because sometimes, uh, or a lot of times, shooting dates aren't known. So there's, there's always something new to learn about old movies or, or music for that matter or anything. And as a friend of mine says, he says this regarding uh, old, old music, but you can apply it to old movies. If you haven't seen it, it's new. doesn't matter when it came out. But technically, all, all uh, movies and music are from the past anyway, because you know, they, have, they have to be recorded and edited and all that other stuff. Um, but, and, but yeah, here's a, another fascinating one. Now, of course, we all know Don Knotts from uh, Andy Griffith's show, it's Lovable Barney Fife, and Probably from Three's Company is Mr. Furley. And then he made a number of movies like The Ghost of Mr. Chicken and The Love God from 1969, where he inadvertently becomes a Hugh Hefner type. It's very PG rated, but it is funny. And that jacket is awesome. <laughs> he, he, he publishes a magazine, he somehow he gets involved, becomes a Hugh Hefner type, um, sort of. You know? <laughs> but as I, I mentioned, there's always, in addition to information, there's always movies to be found as well, because if you research the silent era, only about 20%, uh, that's probably a high estimate too, of silent movies made in the US exist, period. There's, uh, and some of them exist only from prints from foreign sources. And no two prints of any silent movie are quite alike um, because in the silent film days, they would often shoot with two cameras. If you've seen behind the scenes photos when they're filming a silent movie, you often notice two cameras. Well, one was for the domestic negative here in the US and one was for the foreign negative. So a lot of times it would be an alternate take for the, uh, for the foreign negative or it would be an alternate angle. And in some cases, all we have is a foreign print, a lot of times found in Czechoslovakia or the former Soviet Union. And a lot of times silent movies in the teens and 20s, they would be edited for censorship reasons like what play in Chicago when that play in Boston and vice versa. Versa film, you know, nitrate film, which was the standard used in commercial cinema in the US until the early 50s, that deteriorates over time. And also for reissues, footage was cut 
uh, just any number of, of reasons. So again, no two prints of any silent movie are, are quite alike. Um, before the seminar, we were talking about Metropolis. I said, well, there's more and more footage and there's many prints, none of them definite. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, here, here's another fun one. This was very exciting for old movie buffs called The King of Jazz from 1930. Sorry about the glare there. Stars band leader. He was dubbed the King of Jazz, Paul Whiteman, more like the King of Pop. Led a great band in the 1920s. And this was an all color movie, 19. 30, all two color technicolor, red and green. This is before we had three color technicolor, before we had the, the full spectrum of technicolor. But it has an early appearance by Bing Crosby, part of Paul Whiteman's Rhythm Boys, who were the singers in the group. And uh, it was a multi million dollar restoration. And a lot of us who are old movie buffs were really excited about it. I got to see it in the big screen at a festival in LA a few years ago. And then the DVD and Blu ray came out, and you know we were just in heaven and there's and that one was done right because there's lots of neat extras on that disc as well I, i'm one of those advocates who says if you're going to put a movie out in physical media put everything out every like old ads trailers if they exist everything have commentary by someone who's informed there have been some releases that what i call kind of half ass they okay we just put this out and they didn't um, offer information like i offered information to someone on put out a blu-ray which i've seen the restoration looks great but they didn't really take me and my wife up on the rest on the information that we've researched but anyway it, it happens and speaking of the love god i mentioned in in the mid to late 1960s last year i mentioned probably mentioned that there were a lot of records where people did their now today or mod records where the older well i hesitate to say old because a lot of them are younger than me but uh, stars who were established were, were trying to get with it, you know, you know, do their psychedelic album, or whatever, like Arthur Fielder's Superstar. There was the cinematic equivalent too, like this classic atrocity. And I will, I say that with loving intentions called Skidoo, directed by Otto Preminger. He directed classics like Anatomy of a Murder and Laura. This is the one where um, he tried to make a, a drug movie, which turned off the older the young, the older folks and younger folks didn't want to see the older stars, but it is a train wreck of a movie, which you, you realize that how valuable a director is. Otto Preminger, great director, not with comedy, but in that movie, you do get to see Jackie Gleason hallucinating and Groucho Marx's head on top of a screw, and you also get to see Carol Channing sing the theme song, Skidoo, and attempt to seduce, seduce Frankie Avalon. So it's watching just for that, but boy, it's a Oops. tough slog. It's a tough slog, I'll just say that. <laughs> But going back to something that's a bit better than that, yeah. and again, uh, I think someone else's mic is on. Yeah. Uh, okay, but uh, this is a series of shorts, uh, Vitaphone. These were in the olden days, and some of you may recall this, for the feature film, they showed short subjects, a newsreel, and a cartoon. And in fact, all movies started out as shorts. Feature-length films came along uh, in the early mid-teens of the previous century, that is. And the Vitaphone comedy sh musical shorts are a lot of fun, a lot of vaudeville acts that didn't make many movies, a lot of great musical acts, and some really weird Technicolor films, which my wife's adored. But I just adore movies like these. And sometimes I have uh, film nights in my house where all we do is watch shorts, shorts and cartoons, which I have a lot of those as well in the collection. But yeah, and I'm flashing various DVDs and Blu-rays, but I do want to flash a bit of paper I have. A friend of mine sent this to me. This is a repo of a cigarette ad featuring Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy. Yes, long before the danger to smoking were widely known, a lot of celebrities did cigarette endorsements. Laurel and Hardy, Groucho Marx, which makes sense, a lady who's a cigar smoker, Dan Crosby and more, which are just fascinating. And this one says, say Stan, there's throat ease in them their old goals and they're also referring to a comedy short a classic they made called them their hills i don't think there'd be much throat ease in these but anyway it's a it's a mind blower so to speak um and speaking of lost movies which i mentioned earlier this is a fantastic book came out in the mid 90s by frank thompson who's a great wonderful guy and also a wonderful historian and great writer too and actually some of these lost mill movies from the teens and 20s has since been located either whole or in parts. Still a lot of them out there. And 
Well, and, and, and you can see by some of the movies I collect, I like vintage comedies and musicals. I also like a lot of oddities like Skidoo. I consider that an oddity or the love God or uh, another one along the, well, not necessarily an oddity, but it is a fun one. Uh, you may be from Rudy Ray, be familiar with Rudy Ray Moore who, who made uh, several block exploitation movies. He self sort of financed them. He did a lot of raunchy comedy records. And uh, a couple of years ago, Eddie Murphy started a wonderful biopic of them called Dolmite Is My Name. And what was great about Rudy Ray Moore is he was stockly built nearly 50 and he finds himself a movie star, which was great, you know, and, and they're fun movies. Like, like this one right here, The Disco Godfather. You haven't lived till you've seen Rudy Ray Moore in his disco outfit. That's 1979. But somehow Kramer versus Kramer beat it at Oscar time. At no point, in Kramer versus Kramer, did I think anyone put on disco outfit? Now maybe Justin Hoppe did in the European print. I don't know, but <laughs> but anyway, yeah. Just a uh, oh, and here here's a genuine classic. Now a lot of movie buffs love film noir, which actually was not a term at the time. These were known as thrillers, dramas, but this is a classic. Um, film noir came from the French when they noticed after World War II because. A lot of American movies were not seen in France during World War II, obviously due, due to the war and export bans and things like that. But the, a lot of the French noticed, well, the movie, American movies are getting a bit dark. So they have that dark look, femme fatales, you know, guys led astray, that type of thing. Double Indemnity with um, Fred McMurray and Barbara Stanwyck is a, is a classic one. Actually, great movie too. Blu-ray looks fantastic as well. And and this is not an atrocity, but it is a fun, odd movie. Hollywood Party, still made over a year on and off, many directors involved. Uh, it's a real patchwork, but it does have a fun Laurel and Hardy scene in it. And you have Ted Healy and his Stooges. Yes, soon to be three Stooges. Plus you have a Mickey Mouse segment in as well, Mickey Mouse anima animated. You have Jimmy Narani, you see a film within a film as the great Schnazola as Schnarzan, Tarzan spoof. But it, it is fun, you know, totally ridiculous, a lot of fun. And um, let's see, an another favorite I've become quite fond of. Oh, I forgot to mention my t-shirt, which I'm wearing. This is Kenneth Williams. He's also on the mask here, which I will get out for you. Probably saying matron, take them away. Now, Kenneth Williams is an English comic, comic actor. Um, very funny, very over the top, particularly in a series of comedy films I've become fond of this year called the Carry On Movies. This is a DVD set that has all of them in it, the complete Carry Ons. And yeah, the, they got, they were always for the most part PG rated. They started in the late 50s, went to the late 70s. Okay, kind of more seaside postcard humor, but innuendo, but very funny. Um, and, that, and that's the reason I got a multi-region Blu-ray player because there's a lot, particularly if you're into old or odd, obscure or foreign movies, there's a lot of things that were not released domestically here in the US, either in DVD or Blu-ray. So, and I know a lot of old movie buffs, likewise the same, oh, we got to get that English movie, but it's not on region one, it's on region two. So those, those come in handy and they ain't expensive either. So, oh, and uh, I, I was flashing this earlier as well. In addition to some old movie stuff, there's also old TV show like Match Game. Speaking of double and single and Tundra, you know, <laughs> uh, a bit risque. I didn't realize it as a kid, but yes, this was made for, you know, the older folks who were at home. But it just shows, shows you how wonderful 70s television game shows were, you know, innuendo and just all the folks they had on this show. You know, they're all very witty and Richard Dawson, and Brett Summers, Gene Rayburn and things like that. Another great set, Buster Keaton, one of the all-time great movie comedians and directors too. He directed a lot of his own movies. A great set that has most of his silent movies and some of his hockey shorts as well. But, uh, and you know, I, blah, <laughs> I hate when I mess up. But yeah, you know, even after 40 plus years or, or so of doing research, I still find new information or movies I've not seen um, I have some coming in the mail today as well, including a 1982 movie called Pandemonium, which is a PG rated spoof of horror movies that both Melinda, my wife and I like a lot, which, which has scholars like Eve Arden and Paul Rubens, Pee Wee Herman in it. So 
yeah, it, it, it is, as with music, it is a hobby that it's, it's like a bottomless pit, you know, anything you research, whether it be rocks and minerals, whether it be uh, movies, the bottomless pit, and you could go into a specific region or, you know, there's regional filmmaking I like a lot, like researching low budget movies made in Texas, which is one of my hobbies. And also, you know, maybe just pick one year, any year of anything, 1925, and it, it just continues to go down and down. And uh, it'll, uh, and if you find something you like, it, it's just a lot of fun. But I thought I'd open it up to the, uh, for questions, if anyone had any questions or anything that they wanted to talk about. I know Evan beforehand had some things that he wanted to ask. And I can't hear you, by the way, Evan. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Sorry. OK, yeah. So uh, uh, we can open this up, ask a question in the chat, or you can unmute yourself um, and go ahead and ask Dennis a question. I, I can start with one. Um, you know, Dennis, you mentioned all these different genres and, and uh, decades. And, and how, how do you keep all this physical media? I mean, if you want to go look at a Don Knotts movie, <laughs> where, where do you go in your house to find this stuff? How do you keep track of all this stuff? Well, my house is a bit disorganized, more so than usual, because there was some work recently done that not put everything back. And by the way, I, I, that's not all my collection in the background or even on, the, um, on my desk behind me, there's a bunch of DVDs and Blu-rays um, on top of my desk. And actually, I have a, like, like a big tiki sheet on the top of it. Well, well, I try to keep certain things together, like favorite directors, like Ernst Lubitsch, I'll keep director, uh, I'll, I'll keep together, or like all the Lone Hardys to movies together, all the Bob Hope movies to together, that type of thing. So I have an idea. Likewise, with records, although occasionally there's something I can't find. There's been one DVD I've been trying to find for the last couple months. I don't know where it is. But I did have a lot of folks work in my house recently. I don't think they took that one, thankfully, but it, it's around here somewhere. Um, it's just a matter of trying to keep things together. Like on the shelf behind me, one section is carry on movies and related to that. And then there's like a whole Bob Hope shelf and then Laurel and Hardy and friends and then Buster Keaton and Roscoe Arbuckle and friends. And on the top, there's like a box set of the three students. So, uh, that's obviously a, mostly a comedy show. So, it, and you know, uh, so it, it helps to do that more so than with the records because the records, there's too many genres to keep track of. <laughs> oh, okay, uh, Linda asked a question. Uh, she asked about Cantiflas. Uh, yes, uh, Cantiflas was a huge Mexican comic star. He did do a couple of American movies, probably the best knowns around the world in 80 days, where he co stars with David Niven. Did another one called Pepe, but not big success in the US, but in Mexico, yes, and Spanish speaking countries and in Spanish speaking parts of you know, Texas, you can still find a lot of his movies. I've seen ads in the San Antonio and El Paso papers, going back to my research earlier, that have County Flas movies. So, um, you know, big star again, didn't quite translate here, but you know, obviously in Mexico, he's, you know, the equivalent of Charlie Chaplin, huge star. Yeah, it was interesting to me, the, the style, and you will know more about this, that kind of uh, physical humor yeah. that I was wondering if that was just kind of a very big trend during that period of time. Cause I, it, I, and there's a few people that do it in my time, but that was really artful. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, but in any period in movie history or comedy history, there there's lots of comedy going around. You know, when the Three Stooges were big, there was also screwball comedy. So, but but yeah, Cantin Flas, uh, physical comedy was big, and obviously he was a very physical comedian. And physical comedian, being real physical comedian, can be very trying. <laughs> People can do the stunts, but then they kind of walk like you know they're limping a lot afterwards. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it is very hard. I know people like Buster Keaton and Oliver Hardy, 
both had bruises and scars all over their bodies. I know that from people who knew them directly <laughs> said. Um, and then Jay asked, how many DVDs and records do you actually have in your collection? That I don't know. I know it's in the thousands. I, it would take years to count them. At some point, I want to have another garage sale this year. But it, it is in the thousands. That I don't know. I was sorting through DVDs recently to get rid of duplicates or things I had upgraded. Uh, that I don't know. Not DVDs and Blu-rays, nowhere near as many as there are records. There's a lot more records and, and books in here as well and scraps of paper as well, notes that I've made through the decades and, and notebooks. Those are all scattered about too. You know, we talk about this, it's a semi disorganized house, although I can usually find something, you know, uh, but I know other collectors who are far more disorganized than me and other ones who are much more organized than me. Um, and then Jay asked, what is your most valuable holding? Uh, that, that's a good question. I never, put monetary value on things. I, I put it, I put a value to me. Uh, there, I did sell a record one time for about $100, which I bought for 10 because someone wanted it. Uh, and it, it just depends, you know, like I said, everyone likes different things. With mu music and movies, I'm either passionate or indifferent. So a lot of things I have no interest in, but if someone else likes it, that's great. You know, to, it's teach their own. I don't say mine is the best or worst. It's just what I like and I'm passionate about. And it's good to have passions within the passion, you know, hobby within the hobby or have things other than work and family. You know, it's good to have other things to, to balance it out. You know, some, some people it's sports, others it's movies. And Amanda asked, do you collect silent movies? Oh yeah, there's lots of silent movies. As a matter of fact, Here's two really interesting sets right here. I love Kino video, by the way, that Buster Keaton set was some Kino, it's no longer in print. These are fascinating sets, pioneers of African-American cinema. Uh, some silence, some talkies. This is, I think, just about all silent and pioneer women directors. There are actually more women directors in the US in the late teens than there are today, which is in itself is interesting, you know, because they made movies by the ton back then, literally. And then Tara asked, uh, am I subscribed to the Criterion channel? And no, I'm not, but I do have a lot of movies from the Criterion collection, speaking of which, like this one, Design for a Living, one of my favorite directors, Ernst Lubitsch, based on a Noel Coward play, uh, Gary Cooper, Frederick March, and Miriam Hawkins about an unconventional uh, romance. I, I will just say that. A really wonderful, lovely movie. But yeah, uh, Criterion, I've not visited the Criterion channel recently. I know they have a lot of uh, vintage movies, but Tara, if you want to email me directly, I'll check it out and recommend some movies on there. But certainly anything directed by Ernst Lubitsch or uh, anything from TCM would be good. And then let's see, Linda said, any favorite movie systems like Rotten Tomatoes? I don't rate movies. Um, I, I don't believe in stars because there are movies that are not that good, but they're watchable. Um, you know, to me, star system is arbitrary and also greatness as well. For an example, and this is my personal opinion, um, you know, I saw Schindler's List when it was released, you know, God, almost 30 years ago, which is an excellent movie and I highly recommend it. But because of its length, three hours and subject matter, the Holocaust, it's not something you want to I would really want to watch all the time. Likewise, with like The Godfather, that's just me. But whereas something like uh, Ed Wood's Plan After Matter Space, that I will watch all the time. Well, also, it's a lot shorter. And yes, it is goofy, but it's something that really helps me put me in a great mood. So uh, I don't have, I don't rate stuff by stars. I mean, you know, I, I try to find something interesting in all movies. It could be the photography, it could be the uh, the location work, particularly when you have old movies like shot a hundred years ago, there's a lot of location footage. So you get to see what Los Angeles or New York looked like, or in some cases, I saw, I've saw i seen some films shot in San Antonio in the teens, the, the previous century. So that's fascinating. It gives you a record of something that no longer exists. So that's always great. And then 
Lulu asks, is there a movie that you'd love to have but still waiting to find? Tons. <laughs> and this goes back to what I, I may have said earlier that not everything is available, nor would ever be, for writer reasons. There could be rights issues. The film does not exist. It's incomplete. Um, there's a donor restriction with an archive. Um, the studios don't want to put it out because that involves it, a lot of complicated issues as well. So yeah, there are lots of movies I would like to see that are not out there. And also movies on DVD, Blu-ray, like books or records, they go out of print. So sometimes there are movies I'm looking for that are out of print. I know there's one I'm looking for called Nurse, Nurse on Wheels, 1963, made by the Carry On producer director, uh, Peter Rogers and Gerald Thomas, but it's not a Carry On movie. It has some of the same players. That's out of print, and the DVDs I tend to find online tend to be on the more expensive side, but I haven't bought one yet. So that's an example of one. Um, and you know, likewise, not everything's gonna be on YouTube, nor will all newspapers be on there. To really have a complete picture, you have to go beyond what is readily available and do research, which is why I love going to libraries. I, I may have mentioned the Dallas Public Library, looking at microfilm, or decades ago, uh, when I was a student at UT Austin, I'd go to the Collections Deposit Library and check out bound issues and movie trade papers from the 20s and 30s. And that was fun because that information was not available elsewhere pre-internet days. And a lot of it still has beautiful color ads too. And then Liam asked a good one. <laughs> says, do you watch any modern movies or do you have a general cutoff where you get more skeptical about a movie's quality? I don't have any fast, hard and fast rules. Uh, when I talk about music and movies I like, I always say, generally speaking, likewise with the radio show, I don't have a cutoff date because that would limit, that would be limiting. Generally, I'm not as interested in music and movies after a certain time, but that's not exclusive. There's no hard and fast. I mean, if, if it's someone's opinion who I trust and they really like it, I will give it a whirl. I'll give it a go, you know. I might like it and I might not like it. A lot of the more recent movies that I tend to like tend to be set in, in the past, oddly enough. Uh, I mentioned Dolmite Is My Name or the Ed Wood movie with Johnny Depp right here in 1994 and Martin Landau as Bela Lugosi. It tend to be set in the past. But, you know, I, certainly there are great documentaries being made nowadays, a lot of ways better than ever. Uh, but, you know, it's just an aesthetic generally speaking, you know, and likewise in music as well. I, I do see, you know, a number of contemporary movies and I do watch contemporary TV shows like uh, what we do in the shadows and, and uh, Matt Berry, I, I think should be knighted. He is brilliant, brilliant comic actor. But yeah, it's, it's just a general, it's just generally. And believe me, not every vintage movie is a classic. I've seen a lot of horrible ones. <laughs> so, but again, it's just a general aesthetic. Uh, and it would take me a lot more time to go over it in general, but it's just my personal opinion. And then, but yeah, great questions, everyone. Thank you. And then Angela asked, when you're looking for a movie like those you have or, or still be collected lists, that, what resource do you consult? In other words, what, how do you get leads and new items through your collection? Well, I mentioned the Criterion Collection and Kino Video. Certain companies I like a lot because they put out interesting things. You know, Criterion, I highly recommend either the Criterion channel, which I'll do some more research on, or also the collection because Criterion does amazing work. Usually they have a nice booklet. Uh, the film remastered as best as possible. If it's a currently living movie maker, they'll usually have them involved either in a commentary or write an essay or do an interview and it's movies from the silent days of the present all over the globe. Um, so yeah, I'm on Criterion's email list on Kino has been doing great work. They put out stuff, it tends to be a lot lower in price than Criterion. I usually only buy Criterion when they have their half off sales, which they do pretty frequently, which is great. Uh, but Kino's tend to be more bare bone, but they've been putting out a lot of, um, movies that have never come out in home video, a lot of DVDs and Blu-rays and stuff from the 
universal and uh, paramount vaults from the 30s and 40s. And as always, a lot of just interesting movies, some foreign, a lot of and some silence. Um, likewise, of Warner Archives puts things out, you know, economically. Uh, sometimes they're DVD Rs, but you know, there's been a lot of great stuff that came out that otherwise would not come out in a regular DVD or Blu-ray release. So I'm on a several email list, and in terms of trying to find something out of maybe out of print, yeah, you know, just look around, look on Amazon or. Uh, just do some searching online, you know, Google searches or whatever. It's fairly easy. And, um, you know, a lot of movies I buy, particularly really economically, I've never seen before. So there's a lot of things I'm going through the collection. Okay, I've never seen that, but that's the only way I will ever see it. Or maybe I saw it at a film festival years ago. But, you know, it, it, it is a wonderful hobby because you can't have everything and there will always be stuff you'll miss but in, it goes back to what I collect because I realized a few years ago oh I have lots of Bob Hope movies I've always been a big fan so you know I try to get all the Bob Hope I can the Three Stooges uh, certain directors I mentioned Ernst Lubitsch or you know certain things like odd collections of musical comedy shorts in the 30s that type of thing or everything Buster Keaton so again it goes back to the passion you know, I, I, I try to collect things, well, I do it economically, but I also collect it only if I'm passionate. Like I, even when I look, going back to the record stuff, even in the bargain bins, okay, I, I won't buy everything nowadays, but certain things that, okay, I gotta have that, will my life be changed by that? Then yes, you know, it, it'll give you, and every movie, every book, every record, it gives you some insight into the past, whether good or bad, and I don't sneer my nose at stuff or think I'm better or worse than the people who, who made these movies or books or records. It's some type of insight. It's not day to day, day to lot, day to day life per se, but it could be, oh, well, somebody thought enough to make a movie and it had this attitude, which you could show in a mainstream movie then, you know, so it is interesting. You know, I, I look at it historical, sociological and, you know, and, and an aesthetic, you know, movies and music that I enjoy and in our leisure time that's what we should all do and it comes back to passion and trying to find out everything possible and you know collect oddball things like the Kenneth Williams t-shirt or or the mask that type of thing you know red bubbles amazing but um, yeah oh do you have any more questions uh seems like we're dry on the questions but that's quite okay you know? I think we missed one question and it was uh, Jay asked what your favorite three stooges <laughs> oh it, it it's it, it <laughs> i love them all um i actually do like all of the three stooges technically six if if, if you want to if you want to consider all of them i love them all you know i mean originally it was ted healy and his stooges mo larry and shemp so shemp was the original and curly replaced him and then you know uh uh, shrimp replaced curly and and so on but i like them all you know i've come to appreciate joe besser who actually was better when he was doing movies without the stooges and curly joe dorita who actually did some stuff without the stooges and actually was better with the stooges particularly on live tv but in terms of you know the trio yeah curly and shrimp for, for different reasons they both were great you know and brothers along with mo um and then Dina just wanted to say, I just wanted to say that your passion really shines through and thank you for sharing. Oh, you're welcome, Dina. And then Jay said, which are you most similar to? Are you talking about the Three Stooges, Jay? <laughs> okay, well, it's hard to say. I'd like to think I'm most similar, at least off screen to Mo because he you know, was the most frugal with money and worried about money a lot. So maybe Mo, just, he was like Groucho in that respect. Uh, maybe in personality, Shimp, I don't know. My hair can be like Shimp at times, uh, or sometimes it can be like Larry's, you know. Uh, but I, <laughs> I like to say that, uh, well, again, there's a, there's a bit of stooges in all of us as well. Um, and, and astounding that people are still talking about these low budget comedy shorts that were shot in three to five days. They were shot very quickly and very cheaply <laughs> and tightly scripted as well. 
and the later ones reuse footage from the earlier ones. So one of my favorite hobbies within the hobby is watching some of the later Lesser Three Stooges comedies from the mid fifties with Shemp and it's like, okay, what's the new footage and what's the old footage? You can generally spot the new footage. Okay, well, the bags are heavy under Mo's eyes. That's a dead, dead giveaway. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, th I think I have all of them in me. All right, guys, if there's no more questions, I want to thank everybody, and I want to thank Dennis especially for being here today. Um, you know, stay tuned. Next week, we're going to be hearing from Bill Ambrose, and his talk uh, is entitled Lunar Landscapes. So that's going to be very exciting. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, folks. Thank you. <laughs>